Thank you. Yeah, I haven't actually preached here yet this year. Um, I think last time I preached was right around Christmas. Um, and then for health reasons, every time I was on the schedule, we ended up having to cancel me and push me off. So I've actually had this message cultivating in my brain now for at least six months. So I'm really looking forward to like purging it so I can move on. But um, I'm actually going to be speaking today from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Um, and I've been obsessed with that chapter for like five years now. Actually, unless Brent tells me to, unless Brent tells me to preach um, something specific or a specific passage or topic, every message I've preached to you guys has come out of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Um, it's something that I personally believe that if, if someone can perfect what Paul is saying in, in this chapter, um, it's the key to your ministry. It's the key to your calling in your life. It's the key to um, the way that you should, you should uh, conduct yourselves um, on this earth and in, in the kingdom of God. So I'm going to start today right at the, at the beginning. We're going to do 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Um, and this is Paul speaking uh, to the church of Corinthians. He says, Am I not as free as anyone else? Am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen Jesus our Lord in, our own, in my own eyes? Isn't it because of my works that you belong to the Lord? Even if others think I am not an apostle, I certainly am to you. You yourselves are proof that I am the Lord's apostle. This is my answer to those who question my authority. Don't we have the right to live in your homes and share your meals? Don't we have the right to bring a believing wife with us as other apostles and the Lord's brothers do? And as Peter does, or is it only Barabbas and I who have to work to support ourselves? What soldier has to pay his expenses? What farmer plants a vineyard and does not have the right to eat some of its fruit? What shepherd cares for a flock of sheep and isn't allowed to drink some of the milk? I am expressing merely a human opinion. Am I expressing merely a human opinion? Or does the law say the same thing? And this is where I want you to, to pay attention. For the law of Moses says, you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. And... Um, for the longest time, like I said, I've been really obsessed with this, this passage for like five years now. It's really shaped me and shaped my ministry. But for the longest time, I just skipped that first part of the chapter. Because in my mind, that was, oh, that's just for administrative work for the churches. Yes, clearly if someone's a pastor, we need to pay them. That's what the Bible says. It says, do not muzzle the ox as it, as it plows the field. So I dismissed this. I just moved on and just chalked it up to that's, that's for like board meetings and stuff with the church. I shouldn't even have to mess with it. So I moved on, but uh, six months ago when I was originally supposed to preach this, God started putting on my heart that there, there's practical applications, not just to the church and the way it functions, but to individuals in the church and the way that we run our lives. And right at the beginning um, of the chapter, Paul poses a, a series of rhetorical questions and he says, am I not free? Uh, am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen Jesus? Isn't it because of my works that you, are, that you are saved, that you are here? And you can actually take those four, um, four questions and you can actually break them down to Paul justifying his own ministry. First of all, am I free? Have I not been saved? Have I not experienced that freedom that comes from salvation? Am I not an apostle? Have I not been called? Um, have I not been called into ministry? Um, haven't I seen Jesus? Do I not have a relationship with God? Do I not have an ongoing relationship with the Christ? Um, isn't it because of my works? He's saying, have, hasn't my ministry produced fruit? And then he goes on to say that we, are, that, um, we have the rights to live off of the fruit that we produce. Um, before I go any further, I wanted to, to talk more and uh, educate um, the congregation. And there's, a, there's a, definitely a division in the congregation that I want to um, address that you guys may not even know of. Um, there's a group of you that when you drive by a field full of cattle, you look out and you say, look, a bunch of cows. 
But there is the few of us, there is a remnant, there is a small majority of us here that have raised cattle, and we know that cows are not the proper term. Cows actually refer to only one specific type of cattle, which is uh, a female, a, a mother, something that produces milk, something that um, generates uh, the, the milk that we turn into cheese and that we drink. But really, the, the term has been broken down to multiple different things. So cattle actually is what represents all bovine, which is a series of different species. It could be the Holsteins where we get uh, like milk and stuff. Um, and then there's different breeds where we get our beef. And um, then we get like the Angus, which is like really good stuff. Um, and then there's, there's like the, the Texas Longhorns and stuff like that. So there's a, there's a variety of breeds. But there's actually, uh, there's a number of people in here that have raised cattle. I know uh, Sam and Josie, you guys were ranchers out in, it was Arizona, wasn't it? Um, I know Dave, he's not here, but he, wrote, he raised a bunch of steer. Amos, he's raised cattle before. I have cattle. Um, so I just wanted to break down real quick what they were. First of all, you have a bull. I had a slide built, but I didn't get it up here today. But a bull, and I'm going to use agricultural terms, so you guys are going to get a little bit of an education today. But a bull is an intact male that can produce offspring. So if you have children, you are considered a bull. A steer is a castrated male that is no longer producing offspring. If you are done having children and you're a male, you're a steer. And this is how I know that, like, a man named all these animals. Because, like, like, we're the men over here, are like, we're bulls, we're steers. If you are a mother, you're considered a cow. If you are a younger female that has not had children, you would be considered a heifer. It's rough. Now think about this. Adam lived over 900 years. So for 900 years after he named these cattle, every time someone's like, yeah, look at that cow or let me sell you a heifer, he got that glare from Eve for 900 years of like, how dare you name us these things, name this cattle after that. I just think about that all the time. Like what, what a horrible mistake that he's made. But that's all the different, um, the different categories. And then you have calves, which are the, the babies, which everybody knows. Um, but then you have an ox. And that's what Paul is referring to here. And he's actually quoting Moses that says, do not muzzle the ox. Now, when I was young, I thought an ox was its own separate species. I'm playing Oregon Trail on the computer, and my ox have drowned in the river crossing. And I'm just thinking like, oh, we have cattle, we have cows, we have bulls, and then there's this ox. It's like this own separate breed of, of cattle. But really what an ox is, is any cattle that has been trained to work. So any cattle that's been trained to pull a cart, to pull a plow. So this is where I think it's really cool what uh, Moses and Paul are saying here is, um, he's saying do not muzzle the ox. He's not saying do not muzzle the man. He's not saying do not muzzle the woman. He's not saying do not muzzle the old or the young. It's a gender and age neutral term because you can have a calf that's considered an ox as long as it's trained to pull a cart or something. So I think this is a really important thing that um, in this passage, Paul's not just saying only only uh, provide, only pay, only reward this small segment of the, the, uh, the church, the small group of the church. He's saying this is a broad term that encompasses anybody that, with this last question, is anybody that produces fruit. So what Paul's saying here is God has given you gifts. God has given you abilities that you add value to the kingdom, but what he's also saying is you, all, you have the ability to, you have the right to live and flourish off those gifts. Uh, myself, um, I started this uh, food truck a few months ago and we launched it like three weeks ago. Uh, it's been a joint venture with my sister and brother-in-law and my wife and we've been working around the clock for that. And for, for the last five, six months, everybody's like, Zach, what right do you have to start up a food truck? Like you don't even cook your own food. <laughs> How are you supposed to prepare food for other people and then convince them to pay you for it? And I was like, I don't know. I'm just doing it. I got bored in January, so we went out and did this, and we're going forward. So three weeks ago, we launched, and I'm sitting in this truck, and we're, we're kind of freaking out. Like, I don't really know what I'm doing. I don't, 
I don't know how to make food. But all of a sudden, the first paying customer comes and it just clicks. And all of a sudden, I'm multitasking and I'm prepping all this food and I'm putting the meals together. And I realize that running a food truck is not much different than feeding 100 teenagers during youth group in like a 15-minute segment. And I've been in youth ministry for over a decade now. So all of a sudden, all these gifts, all these talents that I've like kind of backlogged or not even paid attention to suddenly are valuable to me. And I'm like moving around and I'm doing this stuff and I'm creating dishes and stuff because I'm used to like walking into the church food pantry and being like, okay, I've got uh, cereal and I've got some marshmallows. All right, we're eating a whole bunch of Rice Krispie Treats today because this is all I got. <laughs> but that's just a, 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 an example here of I've, I was able to develop gifts. I was able to develop talents in the ministry. Um, and then I have the right to benefit off that. And like I said, a lot of times we just equate this to church administration because it's very easy to see someone like Brent who every single week stands up here and he gives a message and we say, okay, that guy has uprooted his family. He's coming here. He's gone through the stresses of church planning and uh, yeah, we should probably pay him. And honestly, like if you, if you look at that and Brent kind of uh, alluded to my health and stuff at the beginning. There, there is a heavy attack. There is a heavy price to pay to stand up here and preach. Um, literally every time I was scheduled to preach, that week before, like all hell would break loose. And eventually Brent, like in his mercy, would be like, dude, we're just, we're going to take you off the schedule. And I'd be like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm like in a hospital bed. I'm like, I'm good. Just wheel me in. So like, once again, this was my week to preach and all hell broke loose. It was a rough week, but this time I was smart and I just lied to Brent and be like, everything's good, Brent. Everything's swell. Like, don't, don't cancel me again. I, I want to get up here. But there is a heavy price to pay for that. And, and Brent, uh, he goes week in and week out without that acknowledgement and without, um, without bringing that up. But that's why he's worthy of pay because there is fruit to his labor. We are all here together as a congregation, as a group, because of the sacrifice that he, he made there. Um, then we want to go on uh, talking about, um, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 still, and we're going to go to verse 18. So then Paul is, is taking this further. He said, first, these are my rights. These are my rights as a member of the body of Christ. These are the rights established to me based on the sacrifice I've put in this kingdom. And then he says, what is my pay? What is the payoff for this? Um, verse 18 says, what then is my pay? It is the opportunity to preach the good news without charging anyone. That is why I never demand my rights when I preach the good news. And if you go down even further, this is where Paul starts to say, um, this is the same chapter where uh, Paul is saying, like, run, like, everyone runs the race, but not everybody runs to win. Uh, this is the part where he's uh, going down further. He says, though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone. To the weak, I become weak. To, to those under the law, I become as those under the law. I become all things to all men, so that by all possible means, I might save someone. So there's almost a dichotomy in this chapter because the first half is Paul saying, these are my rights. How dare you take away my rights? These are the rights established to me by God, by Moses said himself, I'm quoting Old Testament law, do not take away my rights. These are my rights based on the fruit that I've produced for the kingdom. But then he flips himself and says, I surrender all my rights. I give up all my rights. I don't care if my rights are going to cause anyone to stumble or any." Any uh, reduction in the harvest, take away my rights. And there's a dichotomy in there that he, he seems to just kind of flip and say, but why does he do that? What's his, his reasoning behind that? Um, you guys all know that I, I live on a farm, um, and we, we, we produce animals. We raise animals, and that's where, how we make a living. And on any given day, I have uh, a staff of people that help me with uh, the work around the farm. Uh, uh, Kayla's not here, but Scotty's wife, Kayla, she actually helps me with that. She helps manage um, feeding and caring for and, and the, the, the breeding and, and the, all that stuff. But with having that full staff, um, 
the problem is when you get to certain points like holidays. So Christmas comes. No one wants to work on Christmas. So the entire staff gets Christmas off. And the idea behind it is animals still got to eat. Animals still got to be cleaned out. Um, so I myself generally have to go do this with the animals and take care of them on those holidays because the, the staff, they have their rights. No one wants to work. These are grown adults. They're just like, I'm, I got my own families. I'm not working on Christmas, which is totally understandable. So this past Christmas, um, I'm once again laying sick on the couch. Um, it's my job to go feed the animals. I'm sick as a dog, can't do anything. Uh, my kids have just opened all their gifts and Whitney's cooking dinner, um, getting ready for the next part of the day. And all these animals are here that need to be fed. So I turned to Levi and Ezra because they're older and said, hey, I'm too sick. You need to go out there and feed the animals. So this is Christmas morning. They just got done opening the presents. And instead of sitting there enjoying the gifts that they just got, they had to put their stuff aside and they had to go out and they had to feed all these animals. And to their credit, they didn't complain. They didn't whine. Um, they just went and did it. And the reason they did that and why they did that is because they understand one important thing. They understand that this farm, this, this lifestyle that we have, this, this uh, business that I'm building, it is theirs by right as their inheritance. So they're saying that, okay, like, yes, I'll sacrifice from time now because I'm gonna, and I'm gonna go do this work, I'm gonna go take care of this work because I know that in the end, at the end of the day, this, this is all mine. This all will come back to me. So this is what Paul is actually saying in this moment. If you go to uh, Romans 8, 17, he says, if we are his children, then we are also his heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs in Christ, sharing in his spiritual blessings and inheritance. If we share in his, in his suffering, then we also share in his glory. And I love that part right there where he says, we are fellow heirs, uh, the New Living Translation says heirs with Christ. NIV says co-heirs. The King James says joint heirs. And that's what Paul's saying right now. Uh, he's saying that, look, I, I have my rights. I have, I have these things set up and you have no right to, to remove those from me. I have the right to prosper off of the work that I've done. However, if my rights are gonna interfere with the harvest, then I'm gonna forego it all. I'm gonna give it up, I'm gonna let it go. Why? Because my dad owns the fields. My dad owns all of this. And at the end of the day, that entire harvest is mine by birthright. So I'm not gonna do anything that's gonna interfere with the harvest. I'm not gonna do anything that's gonna reduce what we bring in. And church, I think that's, that's a key point that we have. Uh, the American church today, we're, we've become very obsessed with our rights. Um, the, I, we have our right to our freedom of speech. We can say whatever we want here in the United States. We have the right to Second Amendment. We have all these rights afforded to us. And we've spent a lot of time making sure that no one interferes with our rights. No one messes with uh, what is owed to us and what we, we have. But I want to encourage the church, if we were to just give up some of those rights, if we were to say, hey, I know that uh, you are, I disagree with you. I know that um, what you're saying is wrong. It is my right to refuse you. It is my right to debate you. It is my right to say, like, here's the scripture. You are, you are, you are wrong. And what if we just gave up that right? What if we gave up that right to, to be right? Am I right? <laughs> but what if we gave that up and instead came out with love and instead came out in, with forgiveness, instead came out with mercy, and instead came out with hope? That right there is what's going to change our community. That right there is what's going to change this city. Jesus was able to do this with a dozen people that got this concept. It doesn't take large swaths of people to understand this. What I'm speaking today, if just a fraction, if like two or three of you guys understood what Paul is saying, you could go out and change this city overnight. 
And band, if you want to get up and, and uh, get ready. But why is Paul saying this? What, what, what reasoning does he have for giving up his rights? Why does, he, why does he say this? Because at the very beginning, he says, have I not seen Jesus? He's saying that I've had this personal experience. I've met Jesus on the road where I was exercising my rights as a Jewish man persecuting Christians, that I was fully endowed with all authority under the Roman government, under the the Jewish leaders to go out and persecute the Christians because they were offending what I believed. They were offending my rights. But then he had that personal encounter with Jesus and he surrendered those rights. Why? Because Jesus himself, Lord of heaven and earth, Savior of us all, creator of everything, gave up his heavenly rights. He gave up his, his, his authority. He gave up what he was given by right because he was, I mean, he's the alpha, the omega. He's the beginning and the end. And he came down to earth as a lowly man, as one of his creations. And he says, I'm going to give up my rights. He says, I'm going to, I'm going to, sacrifice myself on this cross. I'm going to give up everything I have because you are my inheritance. And he's saying that there's nothing that he's like, I'm not, there's nothing that you could say or do to pull me off this cross. You understand there's, the Bible says that there was legions of angels in heaven, all battle ready that if Jesus was to say, I'm done, it's not, an, it's, it's not worth it take me off this cross and bring me home. That these angels were gonna to come to this earth, destroy the world, and just be done with it. Just scrap it and move on. But Jesus held himself on that cross because he looked at each and every one of us and he said that, he's like, you are my inheritance. He says, I will give up all my rights. I will, I will give up everything owed to me because by my birthright, you belong to me. And he held himself on that cross so that each and every one of us could have that experience, that we can live in eternity with him. I I think that we get too caught up on this life, that this life is it. I think we have too many Christians living for, for today in this world. What can I create for myself here? What can I establish here for myself? when really we should be looking at what does my harvest look like in terms of eternity? Because I don't know if you, you guys realize the concept, eternity is mind blowing. But the way, I, the way I can reconcile it is in my life, I'm 34 years old. I don't remember the first couple years of life. I was, a, I was a baby, I was an infant. I don't have any recollection of my first few years. All I can remember now is the last couple decades. And that's for, for me, that's how I reconcile eternity. That I will live in eternity with Christ. And this life that I live here on this earth is like those first couple years of my life as an infant. I don't remember them. They don't mean anything to me. Because eternity is what matters. Eternity is where it's at. So I want to encourage each and every one of you today, give up those rights. I saw uh, on Facebook a couple weeks ago, a a friend of mine who is a Christian getting in an argument with some people online. And literally one of his statements were, I cannot wait for Jesus to come back because then you'll know. And what a horrific idea that is, that he wanted to prove his rights so bad that he wanted to essentially damn the, those people to hell. That he wanted to say like, it's my, I, I am, I've experienced salvation, I've experienced, I will experience eternity, and I can't wait to prove you right and see you suffer for eternity in hell. What a backwards way of thinking. What a backwards way of living. This life 
is not meant to be built on what we can achieve, of what we can do for ourselves, or the name that we can make for ourselves. This life is meant to be spent building as an inheritance to the next generation. This building that we're standing in is an inheritance from the last generation. We did nothing to earn it. It was given to us. My son's name in my phone is heir to the empire. This isn't mine. My job is to cultivate it for a season and then I move on and let the next generation pick it up and run with it. That's the life, that's the mindset we need to be in. That we are just an ox. We are here to work. We are here to serve. We are here to bring in as much harvest as we can until we get to move on into glory, until we get to move on into eternity. This life is short, guys. And I don't say it in a morbid sense. I say it in a sense of rejoicing that our time on this earth is limited, that we're here to work and then we get to move on to perfection, which sounds super exciting to me. As someone who's sick all the time, it's like, oh man, eternity's gonna be great. If you could just get this, if you could just understand this one chapter, in my opinion, you'll do what you need to do on this earth. You'll live a full life, you'll live a complete life, and you'll bring in the harvest that God has put you on this earth to bring in. Let's pray real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you First of all, for the sacrifice that you made, that you came down on this and you put yourself on that cross because you said, we are your inheritance, that you were not willing to go without, that you were not willing to leave us behind, that you said you would give up all rights for our salvation. And God, with that humility in mind, God, I pray that we would live up to that example, that we would sacrifice anything that you deem necessary to bring in the harvest that you have called us to bring in. God, that we would surrender all luxuries, that we would surrender all comforts, that you would move us to where we need to be, that the harvest would be forever on our minds, day in and day out. God, I pray that this would not just be a church that comes in here on Sundays, listens to your word and leaves, that this would be a church that goes out day in and day out to transform, to terraform, to, to cultivate a harvest in this community. God, that as you give us opportunity after opportunity, that we would not waste them, that we would take them and work them to the fullest extent we can. That when our time is done on this earth, when, when we get to move on to your glory, that the legacy that we left here for the next generation was a, a, a legacy of production, a legacy that saw lives changed, a legacy that set a stronghold in the city of Sylvania that won't be moved. God, we thank you and we praise you for what you're doing in our lives. We are humbled for that you have chose us. In your name I pray, amen.